And most people, when they think of glucose, they think of sugar. But you should think of bread or sugar or cornflakes in exactly the same way. In fact, bread is the gold standard for measuring glycemic index. And it's worse than sugar. The score for bread is 100. The score for sugar is 80. So actually, you're better off having the sugar than the bread. Mm, so, I would disagree, Mark, because in the sugar, there's also fructose. And all the things we talked about, you know, the aging, the inflammation, fructose does it at an even higher rate than glucose alone. That's true. I would argue that if you have that's a true. choice between something starchy and something sweet, I would go for the starchy thing. But better even have some vegetables first, then some protein and fat, and then have the starchy thing. And maybe you won't even want to have the sugary thing in the end. Yeah, I think that's fair. But I also say if you're going to have starch, have... Mm. Uh, you know, I have starch that's, that's in forms that are coming in a good package. So for example, I have a Japanese purple sweet potato at night. Yeah. I love that, which is starch, but it's got full of phytochemicals and fiber, fiber. and vitamins and minerals, and I eat the skin. So it's, it's really actually a very healthy food, and it's quite different than eating white bread, which is and also tasty. a starch. So and, yeah. starches and starches and starch, it really depends on where it's coming from and how it's metabolized. Even oatmeal versus steel cut oats, profoundly different. Absolutely. And this is, so what I've been doing in my work is testing all these things on my own body and using a continuous glucose monitor, showing people the different spikes that happen. So I tested steel cut oats versus regular oatmeal and the steel yeah. cut has a smaller spike and same for bread. So white bread is far worse than something like sourdough, for example, which uh -huh. is worse than something like very dark pumpernickel bread that's all gooey and feels almost from like Germany. a cake because it's so rich yeah. of fiber. Yeah, from Germany. So it's always a spectrum, right? You have to think within a category, there's different types of bread, different types of potatoes, different types of starch, and you can always make a choice yeah. that's a bit better. And you can always add some fiber to it and some vinegar and go for a walk after. So basically, throw some Metamucil and some vinegar on your food and you're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us some of the surprising things, Jesse, that you learned about mm -hmm. your own body and in researching this, about what you thought was okay to eat but actually wasn't, or what you thought wasn't okay to eat but actually maybe was okay. Mm. Well, as I mentioned, you know, I used to have donuts for breakfast. So I really got a cold shower in terms of nothing sweet first thing in the morning. Because first thing in the morning, when your body is completely fasted, your glucose levels will respond incredibly fast to anything that you ingest. So I realized that if I wanted to eat something sweet, for example, a donut, I should never, ever, ever eat it on an empty stomach. I should always eat it after a meal. Yeah. Then in terms of other surprising things, I mean, oatmeal was a big one because they even say oatmeal is for diabetics. I mean, there's oh, all this terrible. information that's terrible. very confusing. Yeah. Rice cakes. Oh my oatmeal God. Oatmeal is not a health food. No, it's not. Rice cakes. It's just crazy, brown crazy. Brown rice spike. cakes. How could they be bad? Uh, I tested brown rice versus white rice. Literally no difference. Well, what if you put like a uh, nut butter on top? Then it's perfect. That sounds really gross, but it probably works. I love it. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> I get the rice cakes and I put like a oh, macadamia butter. Oh, on the butter rice cake. I thought you meant butter. put the nut butter on actual rice, like warm no, rice. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> You get a rice cake and you put on the, the nut butter and it's, it's yes. kind of good. I don't, then I, that I, works. I, yeah. Then that I think, works. I think so, so, so all the breakfast things are really in this country so geared toward extremely high levels of starch and sugar. And in fruit fact- Fruit juice? Yeah, fruit juice is terrible. What, you know, right? And, and I think people need to realize that the most important thing they need to do when they eat in the morning, eat plenty of protein, fat, and fiber. Yes. Because those are the magic tricks to actually keep your blood sugar normal. Protein, fat, and fiber. And you have to That's learn what foods have protein, fat, and fiber. It's, it's a little bit of an education because, you know, as most people may not know, but it actually, it actually is the key to success. And you're, you're, you're basically saying eat protein, fat, and fiber before you eat any starch or sugar. And that will exactly. mitigate all the results. Exactly. Something else that was very surprising was oat milk creates a oh. big glucose spike because it's no, made no more oatmeal lattes, the oat milk lattes. No, no way. Yeah. Huh? People got really sad when I posted that test. I was like, I'm sorry. I know you guys love your oat milk, but it's just, it's just a big bowl of glucose. It's dessert. Have it as dessert. Don't have it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. And then, um, fruit was actually quite surprising to me, Mark, because I learned that fruit have been bred for centuries to be extra sweet and extra juicy and contain yes. lots of glucose and fructose. So 
especially grapes. Yeah, grapes are the worst. You eat 20 grapes, super big glucose spike. So I learned that anytime I have fruit, always put clothes on it. I'm French, so grapes and cheese. I actually just posted that test yesterday on my Instagram, Glucose Goddess, if anybody wants to see it. If you add cheese to the grapes, the glucose spike is smaller because you're adding, you know, this fat. But it's and still it's there. It's still there. But it's still there. Yeah. So have it as dessert. Um, yeah. Pineapple, bananas, definitely always put some clothes on those. Um, and I've really completely changed the way I ate, Mark. I mean, now for breakfast, I have leftovers. This morning, mm. I have leftover green beans and cauliflower and two eggs. I don't have so cravings dinner for breakfast. anymore. Dinner for breakfast. Dinner for breakfast. I feel I feel better than I ever have, and I'm older than I ever have. I feel so good. I don't have any cravings. I have energy throughout the day. I don't. I don't even drink coffee anymore because I have so much energy just naturally. I mean, I sleep amazingly. It's it's very powerful. That's amazing. So you basically have learned how to hack. Now, what other foods you thought were were bad for you that actually weren't so bad? Well, there was this whole thing about fat is bad for you. You know, mm. fat makes you fat, fat's not good. And I learned that actually that's not the case. You know, what drives heart disease the most is fructose in your liver, creating mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> low density LDL. And that fat is actually your friend. And so I started putting way more avocado and avocado oils and olive oil and good fats like that, eating more fish. And that really helped stabilize my glucose level. Um, other foods that I thought were bad that were actually good. Hmm. I think it was mostly the other way around. I, it was lots of foods I thought were good that were actually bad. What about so yourself? Fruit. What did you discover? So fruit. Yeah, fruit, fruit. Right? Yeah. I think fruit, fruit has, you have to be careful with fruit because it depends on the fruit. It depends on how uh, yes. you know, sweet it is, how it was bred, the kind of fruit. You know, like when you, when you go kind of get a wild fruit, they're very sweet, but they're very, they're very small, you know? Yes. And I think, you know. Oh, dried oh, fruit is another big one. Oh, dried fruit's terrible. Yeah. Terrible, dried fruit's like terrible, candy. Terrible. You know, it's it just is like candy. candy. And yeah. now what I do, you know, when I want something fruity, I'll have one of your shakes, um, the, you know, the berries with nut butter and lots of nuts in them, chia mm -hmm. seeds, mm -hmm. uh, almond milk, like that kind of stuff. And that makes for a very satisfying fruity uh, little snack, but that contains all this extra protein and fat and fiber to minimize the spike. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. Create a, I call it a fat shake. So you basically take you know, nuts of any kind, throw in a bunch of nuts, like almonds, walnuts. Uh, you can take pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds, uh, hemp seeds, and then throw, <coughs> throw in some uh, berries. And frozen I, berries. I, uh, frozen mm -hmm. berries. I put in cranberries in there. Maybe throw some mm -hmm. lemon in. Maybe I'll throw a couple of tablespoons of nut butter sometimes to make it creamier. And you put in some non-sweetened macadamia milk. I hope macadamia milk is not bad because I, I use that a lot. <laughs> I got to check that no. out. Because <laughs> you were telling me that's like oat milk. I'm like, oh boy. Uh, no, and, it comes from and, nuts, so it's fine. <laughs> it's good. Okay. And, and uh, you blend it up and you can throw in greens in there. You can throw an avocado mm -hmm. in there. I throw, you put can some throw cacao in, nibs on top. Cacao, oh yeah, cacao nibs are good. So you can make a really yummy smoothie that's basically not from processed powders but actually from whole foods uh, i have that mm -hmm. recipe in my book ultra simple diet i'm no, sorry the uh, 10 day detox diet which uh, has that recipe in it and, and you i can think add even, some protein powder too you can add some protein powder and I, I think you know particularly in terms of muscle mass it's really important and the science is so clear on this that we need high quality protein in the morning particularly yeah. to load up and build muscle synthesis we need about 30 grams and we it has to be high quality protein, protein which it all. has to include amino acids that are found primarily in meat or animal products. Now, if you're a vegan, you have to figure out how to get those extra amino acids. You have to supply amino acid powders and add them in because if you don't have leucine, which is very low in plant proteins, you can't trigger protein synthesis. In other words, building muscle is cr critical. And you look at, I mean, not judgmentally here, but if you look at most vegans, they tend to lose a lot of muscle mass. And the longer they've been on a vegan diet, the worse their muscle loss is. And you go, oh, they're thin, they look good, it's, you know, their weight's great, but no, they're actually can be metabolically unhealthy. They, they, in fact, they can get what we call a tofi, which is thin on the outside, fat on the inside, or metabolically obese normal weight, we call it, mm. or otherwise called skinny fat. <laughs> <laughs> most commonly and, known as skinny fat yeah you look skinny but you're really fat and and that actually is is, is just as dangerous as, as as actually being 
overweight in terms of risk for heart attacks, diabetes, strokes, all the same, same risk factors. So I, I think people need to understand that, that you got to look under the hood. You got to look at what's yeah. going on. So maybe you're, you're a vegan and you, you're like, okay, well, how am I going to get protein in the morning? I don't want to eat meat or I have a whey protein shake, but what can I do? Well, you kind of have to look at your own biology. And, and I encourage people to look at their continuous glucose monitoring. I encourage people to like, measure fasting insulin, even measuring a two hour post meal insulin level, uh, which you, most doctors will not order, but you can try to get them to order it. And if not, you can just, you know, maybe order it yourself. There are now companies where you can order stuff yourself, but I think it's really important. You can go to IHOP Whereas and have you breakfast. Said, yeah. You said that in your podcast with Casey or your Instagram live, you said, just eat something that has a bunch of glucose in it, eat a bunch of yeah. rice. And then two hours later, go get <laughs> your insulin, and your exactly. glucose tested and you'll know. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's really important. Uh, so the, the, you know, the tips you gave are so important, you know, the, the uh, sequencing of food. Yes. I mean, even if you have a glass of wine, I mean, the worst thing in restaurants, right? Because what do they do? You want to drink? Here's a bread basket. You know, it's like yeah. the worst possible thing you could but actually do for actually, your Mark, health. If you think about it, if you're a restaurant owner and you want people to order a bunch of stuff at your restaurant. Of course. That's what you do because you give them bread. They eat the bread first, big glucose spike. 90 minutes later, they're crashing. So they're super hungry and they want to order dessert. I mean, it's of brilliant. Of course. Of course. It's brilliant. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I wonder if they know that or if it's just sort of a habit, but it, it definitely, it's a sure way to get people to order more food. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I think drinking wine, the timing of the food, when you eat what matters. And it's yes. not just about time restricted eating, but it's even the sequence of eating in a meal. Absolutely. It's actually the, the combinations of the food that you eat. Mm -hmm. Like you said, don't eat naked carbs. That's a mm -hmm. really important concept. The vinegar thing is a very cool hack. The walking muscles. after eating mm -hmm. is really important. Getting your muscles to work and suck up the glucose, super mm -hmm. important. Were there any other surprises or things you learned as part of your, your investigations, uh, your, your scientific sort of yes. diving into your own biology? Maybe we can talk a little bit about alcohol because mm -hmm. I think this is one of the places where context is very important to think about the fact that glucose is not everything. So if you just have a glucose monitor and you drink two bottles of wine, <laughs> your glucose levels will stay steady, but, and they might even decrease actually, because the alcohol is interfering with your liver's job to release glucose into the bloodstream. But the issue is you might think, oh, well, my glucose levels are steady. This must mean that this food is good for me. And on the completely opposite end of that spectrum, I discovered that when I exercised, I sometimes saw a glucose spike. Yeah. So if I was just looking at my glucose, everything from the glucose lens, I would think, okay, wine, good for me, exercise, bad for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sounds like a great plan. How, so, do I, how do I get on that, that health plan? Let's see. A <laughs> bottle of wine and skip the exercise. Okay. No? Perfect. Well, then you'll have steady glucose levels, but you're going to get severely sick. And I realized, okay, there's some instances in which it's important to look beyond glucose. So in the case of alcohol, yes, it keeps your glucose level steady because it's hurting your liver. That's not a reason to drink alcohol. Similarly, when you exercise, you might see a glucose spike because your liver is releasing all this glucose so that your mitochondria can make energy. But the downsides of the glucose spikes, so the toasting, the inflammation, etc., are actually counteracted by all the positive sides of exercise. So yeah. in the balance, it's a positive effect on the body. <laughs> so I learned, I learned about nuance, you know, it became yeah. very important. Um, and it's very interesting when you start diving into it, but you definitely need context. If you wear a glucose monitor for the first time, you need yeah. to have some information to make sure you understand these pitfalls. You know, it's interesting. I, I had the same experience. I, I, uh, I had a, good protein shake, my blood sugar, I had my continuous glucose monitor on. It was like, maybe went up to 90 after my protein shake in the morning. I thought I'm going to go play tennis. And I, I really worked out hard. I had a great tennis game. And then I checked my glucose. My mom, it's going to be really good. I checked it and I was like, holy crap, it's 145. And I was, I was, I texted Casey <laughs> right away. I was like, what's up with this? He's like, yeah, yeah. Well, that's normal because when you exercise, you increase cortisol, you increase yeah. your blood sugar increase adrenaline you actually release glycogen from your muscles so yes when you're running from the tiger you want to release a lot of glucose so you can fuel your muscles but mm -hmm. you know the body doesn't really know that there's tennis it just knows that you're running because you're chasing a tiger or you're being chased topic, by a tiger yeah on the topic of being chased by a tiger i also saw a massive glucose spike after i gave a presentation to the whole company when i was working in silicon valley 
And I was quite, quite stressed out. And after the presentation, I checked my glucose levels and I just huge spike to 200, but very short and rapid spike. And that was because my body was preparing for me to run <laughs> far away and fast from the tiger. So released all this glucose into my bloodstream. Yeah. And it was really cool to just be able to see what was happening and to understand inner working. Then, of course, it got me just incredibly curious. And that's how this whole journey started. Well, well, that's an important point you're making, that stress alone causes you to have imbalanced blood sugar. Yes. And stress alone will release cortisol, which then causes you to increase your glucose levels and to become diabetic and to become more insulin resistant. So short-term spikes of cortisol are great. You need them to wake up in the morning, go deal with any kind of urgently stressful situation. But it's the chronic low-level stress and unmitigated, unremitting stress that actually causes us to have these metabolic problems down the road. So stress yeah. actually makes you gain weight, believe it or not. Yeah. And poor sleep as well, Mark. So I discovered, I used to have a cappuccino every morning, and I discovered that on the days where I was rested, the cappuccino wouldn't create a big spike. But then on the days oh. where I was tired, the cappuccino would create a much bigger spike in my body. So I did the research and I, I found out that when you're not rested, your body has a harder time dealing with any influx of glucose into your system. So what I found out is that the days when I'm feeling tired, to put all the chances on my side to not create a big glucose roller coaster, always savory breakfast, like non-negotiable. And then I try to get in 10 minutes of high intensity exercise, you know, very soon after I wake up. So jumping jacks, whatever, put on a YouTube video, like 10 minute hit class. And this helps my body become more insulin sensitive. And so I don't create this big spike from that cappuccino. Because mm. what's so awful and so vicious is that when you're tired, you really crave sugar even more because you're feeling oh, yeah. like it's going to give you energy. But the problem is that same sugar that you're going to eat will create a bigger spike than usual, putting you on the cravings roller coaster, and then you're going to crave yeah. even more sugar. For so sure. anybody I, I, tired, absolutely. use the hacks even more. It's even more important. I remember that. You know, when I worked in the emergency room and I wouldn't sleep all night, I would, <laughs> I mean, I literally would like go to the 11 o'clock at night shift. I would have a quadruple espresso a half a pint of ice cream and a giant chocolate chip cookie. No. And then I would go to work. <laughs> no. Okay, so like, you were throwing shade on my it Nutella was, crepe, but you were doing it, some pretty naughty would, stuff too. I, it was, I was like <laughs> jacking myself to get through the night so I could actually stay up all night and see patients. And then I would, and I would kind of crash at three in the morning and, or two or three in the morning. And I'd go to the McDonald's and I'd get an apple strudel and a bunch of French fries. <laughs> because, and it was the only thing open in the hospital <laughs> in the middle of the night. And, and I, you know, I think the data is so clear that when you are sleep deprived, and they've done this with healthy young volunteers, your ghrelin levels or ghrelin levels go up, which makes you hungry. And the hormone that keeps you having a break on your appetite called PYY goes down. And so you end up in this, this double whammy where the thing that's supposed to make you stop eating is shut off. And the thing that makes you want to eat more and more goes up just from lack of sleep. Yeah. And it's vicious because you feel like the sweet stuff is giving you energy. But then as we know, it's actually harming the long-term ability of your mitochondria to make energy. So, you know, you think that the apple strudel is giving you energy, it's giving you pleasure, but long-term it's harming you. Amazing. So, so what, uh, to close here, what does the uh, typical day in the life of a glucose goddess look like? Okay, so let's see. Morning leftovers for breakfast. So as I mentioned for this morning, it was leftover cauliflower and green beans and onion, and then I had some eggs. Mm -hmm. Then what often happens to me, Mark, is that as I'm going for my walk in the morning, I'll see something that looks really tasty. Usually it's chocolate based. And so what I do now is that I buy the tasty thing, but I don't eat it right then. I tell myself I'll have it for dessert after my lunch. So before lunch, tall glass of water with some vinegar in it. Lunch is usually lots of greens, some nice protein. You know, I eat everything, so it's probably going to be some meat or chicken or fish. Mm. And then I have the little sweet thing that I bought for myself. And then I go for a walk or I work out or I do some exercise, whatever it is, or I dance around, do my laundry. And then for the evening, if I have friends over, what I'll do is I'll do a big plate of vegetables that people can munch on while I'm cooking. So, you know, in France, we have this thing called crudité, which is um, raw vegetables, carrots, cucumbers, maybe with some hummus, some avocado. So people munch on that. And then for dinner, I'll serve more vegetables, some protein and fats that people will eat in second, and then some starches. 
So actually your um, purple Japanese potato really got me inspired. So I'll do that one next time. <laughs> and people know to eat that last for sure. And then I get everybody up. We go for a walk around the block. So when people get back, they have a lot of energy and they help me clean up the kitchen. It's as simple as that. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Chia seeds are a great source of omega-3 fats. They have more calcium than milk. And they're a great source of anti-inflammatory compounds. And they're great for glowing skin and mental health and clarity and much, much more. Chia seeds have 10 grams of 